Shalom, Havarim. Hello, friends. Good to be, hello. <laughs> Good to be back with you after our vacation time away last weekend. You're going to hear a few stories from my, my trip. I'm going to use the scare quotes, vacation. Um, if you haven't picked up on it yet, we had a strange trip. But I did have one of those moments that just makes you kind of proud as a father. And I'm going to share that story with you today as we begin. Usually I start with a joke, and this is no different. It is a joke, but it's not my own joke. You see, last week at this time, one week ago, we were at Camp Amigo in southern Michigan. This was part of a family reunion, Sonia's family. She has family in northern Indiana, and Camp Amigo is kind of the highland retreat of the Indiana-Michigan Mennonite Conference. So the family reunion got together at this, this church campsite, and there's also this small lake on this campsite. So it, it borders the lake. They don't own the lake. The campsite offers canoes for campers to take out on the lake as well. So one day, Paxton and a couple of his cousins go out on the lake on one of the canoes that are offered by Camp Amigo, and they're, they're canoeing around. They want to try to canoe across the lake to get to the other side where there is a beach area where there's like this activity area, there's a place for people to play. Some of their younger cousins are there swimming. So Paxton is wearing those clog type shoes that are really popular. They look kind of like these ones that are depicted here. Uh, they're waterproof, they're appropriate for canoeing. Uh, his were not this color, but you get the idea. And as he gets to the other side of the lake, he jumps out of the canoe to pull the canoe onto the shore. And the water is dark, he can't see to the bottom of the lake. The ground underneath is mucky and muddy. So his shoe sinks into the muck and into the mud, and he loses it. It comes off of his foot, it's stuck in the dirt, he can't really find it, he can't see, he can't feel it with his bare foot. He decides to just go to the shore with one shoe on as his cousins and he pull the canoe onto the shore. And these other little cousins are around there playing in the water. And my son, without missing a beat, says to these younger cousins, be careful, there's a croc in the lake. Uh-huh. I'm like, I'm mad that you lost your shoe, but I'm kind of happy about that. That was a good one. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right? It's you know it, was, it was Father's Day you know, for me, so it was a good day. Ah, oh, so I'm out of practice. I don't even have my notes ready. Oh, it is good to be back here. It's good that I had a chance to be away last week. We had some travels. We went from northern Michigan to southern Michigan with a stop at the hospital in the middle through Ohio and back home. I'm going to share more of that story during our sharing time. I apologize if you feel like you're just getting bits and pieces, but it's good to know Sonia is here today. She's doing well, and she did. <laughs> I made the joke earlier. Um, my... My family, my grandparents had this mug growing up. It said on it, I left my heart in San Francisco. You know, every, every state has this kind of a motto. You know, Virginia is for lovers. I left my heart in San Francisco. If you find a mug out there that says, I left my appendix in Michigan, you know, let me know. <laughs> yeah, what do you got, Casey? Good shall overcome evil is the true motto of Virginia. Thank you. Um, so we had this, this trip. We, were, we went all over, but it was good to be away. Um, Bro Jancy did a great job in my absence. I only lament that he couldn't go longer in his sermon, and two of you got that joke. <laughs> um, but yeah, and the people that helped out last week, I thank all of them as well. Great chance to let other people exercise their gifts in the church. Well, today we're going to be looking at this story from the book of Genesis. And as I hear this story, as I first looked over it, it made me kind of wish we were still in the Sermon on the Mount, because you know, the Sermon on the Mount was a really tough series. We talked about some really challenging things, um, but this one, it, it actually it caused a little trauma. Like, it makes me feel a little, I don't even know how to describe the feeling I get. It makes me lament the way we have treated other people, other human beings, people created in the image of God. So what we want to do is I'm going to try to keep it light. Like, <laughs> now that we've talked about abusing our slaves, let's try to keep it a little bit light today. I want to try to include a little humor, a few personal stories, but I want to look at this story of Hagar 
and how she has been overlooked so much by the church and taken for granted, just like she was thousands of years ago by people like Abraham and Sarah. And I want to look at not only the story of Hagar, I want to look at the story of Abraham. Because one of the things that I see with the story of Abraham, like Abraham's one of the top three people in the Old Testament. If you were to name three people from the Old Testament, most people are going to name Moses, David, and Abraham. And you look at the stories of Abraham, Abraham was not necessarily a good dude. Like, he had his problems. Like, you might look at your family and say, your family's messed up, but has your dad ever tried to save, ever tried to send his, his slave woman out into the wilderness with his son that he had with that slave woman so that they could both die of thirst and hunger? I mean, so at least your family's got that going for them, right? Like, Abraham had his problems, but he's known as a person of faith. And I also want to show that even though, even though Abraham messed up a lot, God still used him. It's never too late to turn things around, to do something for God. So we'll look at those two things. We'll look at the story of Hagar, and we'll look at the story of Abraham, and see how God can use us to this day. So I want to start today by turning back. We have to go earlier in the book of Genesis, and today's going to be really heavy on Bible stories. A um, little more Bible stories than we're used to, kind of a Bible study this morning. Because to understand the story of Hagar, we have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, when God called this guy to leave his family and to go to a place that God would show him. And this man and his wife, they changed their names between our story today and Genesis chapter 12. I'm simply going to use the name that we probably know better. Those names are Abraham and Sarah. So God calls Abraham and Sarah to leave their land, to go to a place God would show them. And soon after they leave, a drought hits this land. And they have to go down into the land of Egypt, where there is water flowing because of the Nile River, and there is food there. Now, as Abraham's going down to Egypt with Sarah, he realizes that Sarah is kind of attractive. And if he takes Sarah into Egypt, they're going to want to have her for themselves. He realizes that he has to lie to the Egyptians to save his own skin. So Sarah and Abraham come up with this teaching, this idea that he's going to tell everybody that she is his sister so that they won't kill him. You got that? You heard it right, right? They're going to lie to people to tell them that Abraham and Sarah are sister and brother, brother so that they won't kill him so they can have her for himself. Like you do, right? <laughs> We've all been there. So this works. Obviously, Sarah must be attractive. Even Pharaoh finds her attractive. Pharaoh invites her into his palace. And, and for the G-rated version of this, let's just say your worst imagination is probably appropriate here. The worst thing you can imagine is probably correct. So Pharaoh, Pharaoh invites Sarah into his, his temp, into his palace, and then he, it says in Genesis 12, treated Abraham well for her sake, and Abraham acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. All right, so far, Abraham seems like a bit of a, a jerk, right? He's He's, I mean, I'm just going to use the strong language. He's prostituting his wife out for his own sake. And not only that, the thing I have underlined here is that he acquires male and female servants for this transaction. Now, these male and female servants, they are not named. But if we turn further into the, into the Bible, we go to Genesis chapter 16, we find the story of Hagar and Sarah. Hagar, it says, is an Egyptian slave girl that is owned by Sarah. How does Sarah acquire this Egyptian slave? We assume that this is the transaction that just took place right here. Now, in this passage, Sarah does not use Hagar's name, nor does Abraham use her name. The only person that uses her name is the narrator in the story. And the story tells us that um, Sarah is not able to have children on her own. So she and Abraham devise this bit of a plan that Abraham is going to have children with Hagar, the slave girl owned by Sarah, and that any children that she has, Sarah will claim for her own. That person will become Abraham's descendant. Well, it works, and Hagar becomes pregnant. She is younger than Sarah. 
And then almost immediately, Sarah starts to resent Hagar. If you look at the text in Genesis 16, verse 6, it says that Sarah mistreated Hagar. And that's really a soft word, because if you look in Exodus 1, 1, the same word in Hebrew is used to describe how Pharaoh treats the Egyptian or the Israelite slaves later. So Sarah is abusing Hagar, and um, Hagar says she decides she's had enough. She runs away. She leaves that place and goes out into the wilderness, and the angel of the Lord appears and begins speaking to her. And she says, fear not, for that child in your womb will also be a great nation. And you are to give him a name, and that name is Ishmael. That name means God hears God has heard your cries. God is not going to ignore your, 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 your pain, your punishment, your suffering. God is with you. So she returns to the family, and she does bear a child for, for Abraham and Sarah. We jump ahead to today's passage, and we find this passage from 21.10. This is Sarah speaking years later, about 14, maybe 15, or even 16 years later, Sarah says, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. And this is what I was trying to draw our attention to earlier on. Notice in this passage that Sarah never calls Hagar by name. She also doesn't refer to to, to, uh, Ishmael by name. That is, the slave's son. They're always referred to as your slave or her slave or his slave. Never do Sarah or Abraham use their names. So let's lighten it up here just a little bit and ask the question, why does it matter whether or not we use someone's names? Okay, so I mentioned that last week at this time we were in southern Michigan and it was very important to break our trip home up into a couple of different sections. Again, we had somebody recently out of the hospital who had surgery. Um, so it was really helpful to drive the about three and a half miles to go from southern Michigan to my parents' farm in northeast Ohio. And if I haven't mentioned it before, you maybe aren't aware, but you probably are aware that I grew up on a dairy farm in Ohio. So that meant that growing up, I had hundreds of pets. Am I wrong, AJ? Do you have any pets at your place? (laughs) A lot of pets, right? (laughs) Um, Kids had a chance to meet a few of those pets as well. There's a couple bull calves there that are just a day or two old that they got to meet in Ohio. Now, growing up, we often had the traditional pets. We had cats. We had dogs. Um, Nobody was in the house. the, The children were allowed in the house. The pets weren't allowed in the house. Um, but we always had cats, we had dogs, and, and everything had names. You know, the cats, I don't even remember what cats we had. There's even like, one's called Scarity now. Do you remember any cat names? Uh, Fluffernugan. There's Fluffernugan, that was my nephew got to name a cat. Um, who did, Anna? All right. Um, we had a dog named Daisy. Uh, we had one named Yippy. We had another dog named Shaq in the 90s. Um, you just named your pets. And I also had some less than traditional pets. We had a pony named Sue. I had some full-size pigs, uh, female, female pigs. Uh, they were Bertha, Betty, Benita, and I can't come up with a fourth B. My mom will probably cringe when she hears that. Um, can't come up with a fourth one. We had weird pets growing up. My mom had a couple pot belly pigs as well, uh, Mitzi and Muggsy. Everybody had names. But the one thing that we learned was when there was a bull calf born, you don't give a name to that calf. You see, the bull calves only had stayed on the farm for about a week, and then they would go to the auction. And um, we didn't know it at the time. <laughs> they went to the auction where they went to live on another farm, right? Um, they would go and probably be raised for veal. Um, these calves right here are probably now somewhere being raised for beef. Um, you don't name them because when you name them all at once, you develop a relationship with them. Like all at once they become more than just that bull calf. All at once they become, you know, fluffer nougat or, or buddy or lefty or whatever you might call them. And you develop a relationship 
with them. It's a lot harder to send them off to the slaughter because they have a relationship with you. And if we want to give like this kind of humanized kind of perspective on it, we might say that they have agency then. Like this becomes its own being. It's not simply a bull calf. It has an identity and it has a relationship to you. And it's a lot easier to send that bull calf off on the trailer when you don't have that relationship. And I would say it's a lot easier to abuse another human being when you don't know their name or you don't use that name. So it seems in this story that it's not just by chance that Abraham and Sarah don't call Hagar by name. They choose to refer to her as that slave girl because when you continue to refer to her as that slave girl, she becomes very, she's little more than just a baby producer or a laborer for you. All right, so let's keep moving. I love this part. We jump ahead to chapter 16, and I look at the first part of, of uh, verse 13. And here Hagar is. She's out in the wilderness. The angel of the Lord has spoken to her, and she, that's Hagar, give, gave this name to the Lord. Let's stop right there. How many other times in the Bible do we find a time when a person names God? <laughs> Like, I imagine the story of, of Moses. Moses is there standing before the burning bush, and he asked the burning bush, what will I tell people when they ask, who sent me? Like, what is your name? Moses is asking the burning bush, the God in the burning bush. Here, Hagar is giving a name to God. And she calls God the God who sees me. In Hebrew, it is El Roy I. You shouldn't have, no, don't roll the R's. <laughs> That's Spanish. El Roy I. Um, we tend to anglicize it. We sell, say El Roy. And if you can't remember that, think of the young kid in the Jetsons. <laughs> um, I don't know if that was actually if he was named after this character, but El Roy simply means the God who sees me. So here is the story of this slave girl plucked up out of her home, given to Abraham and Sarah after Abraham has prostituted his wife. She goes with them. She's abused by this family. She's made to bear this child for this man. She feels totally left out, forgotten about, out in the wilderness by herself. And all at once, God speaks to her through this angel, says, you will have this child who will be a great nation. God hears you, so name this child Ishmael. And she responds by saying, you are a God, not like any other God. You are a God who sees even me. Somebody who doesn't even have a name among my own people. They simply call me that slave girl. You, God, see me. And it makes me think of a story from the New Testament as well. It's a story that's very familiar to us, I'm sure. It's the story of the woman in the alabaster box. See, there's a story in the New Testament where Jesus is sitting in the home of Simon the Pharisee, and he's a rich guy. He's got a lot of power. He's kind of like Pharaoh was back in the Old Testament. He's got power. He's got money. He has authority, and he invites Jesus to come into his house, probably so he can capture Jesus, catch him in a lie or a trick or something like that. And as he sits there, this woman comes in because they have kind of these open, I mean, I guess they must have an open courtyard. She wanders into his home. Again, it's normal. It's what you do. But she comes up to Jesus, and she has this bottle of expensive perfume, and she dumps the whole thing on Jesus' feet. She weeps, and she washes his feet with her hair and her tears. And Simon the Pharisee, it says in the text, I think it's in Luke's text, he says, if you only knew who this woman was, you wouldn't let her touch you. And you know what Jesus' response is? The first words that he says to Simon, he says, Simon do you see this woman? Simon, do you see this woman? Well, of course Simon sees this woman. Like he's there com like complaining about her presence. Like if you knew who that was, you wouldn't let her touch you. Simon sees this woman. No, Jesus says, do you see her? Not just her physical body, not just what she's done, not her, just her characteristics. Do you really see her? Because if you saw her for the way I see her, you wouldn't be treating her this way. Simon, do you see her? You ever have those sermons that you sit down and you write them and um, a couple days later you realize you can't preach the sermon that you just wrote, you have to change it up a bit? Is that just me? No. <laughs> um, I'm going to play with the rest of this sermon and I might not actually get back to what I was going to say. Um, 
This doesn't happen every Sunday. For those of you visiting for the first time, <laughs> um, but this is what I was going to say. I was going to work with this text. I sat down Thursday. We got back from our trip on Wednesday evening. Thursday, I came in, just dedicated the day. I wrote this sermon. I worked with this text, and I wanted to talk about how when we went to this family reunion in southern Michigan, we had come from the hospital. Sonia got out of the hospital on, on Thursday. On Friday, we went to this family reunion, and I'm already an in-law, so I'm kind of one of the outsiders in the group. And I go into this family reunion, and guess who got all the attention? Oh, Sonia, tell us about your experience. Tell us about what happened. Tell us the story. Tell us how it was. Oh, you must be so disappointed. Tell us about all of these experiences you had. How was the hospital? How was the food? How was the weather? What do you mean the weather? You were inside. We were out in a tent. Um, all these things are going on, and I'm feeling kind, kind of like nobody sees me. And I, you know, I'm okay with that because I'm kind of an outsider anyway, a loner. Um, but I realized in that moment, everybody was asking about her and not about me. And I felt like an outsider who is already an outsider because I am not blood. And I have thought about having this kind of secret group. Um, it's, the secret's out. Like whenever we go to these family reunions, having a group of just the in-laws that we get together and do something on our own because we don't share a lot of things, including genetics, um, so I already feel like an outsider. Everybody's coming to Sonia. You all know what I was going to say there, right? This is about God sees me. Even in the midst of this feeling like I'm an outsider, God still sees me. I matter in that moment. Even when another cousin comes up and says to me, who are you again? <laughs> There's a lot of kids in that family. <laughs> I'm going to make a bad joke about a croc. Um, when I feel like an outsider, God still sees me. So I've got this in my mind. I wrote my sermon on Thursday. I did the notes in PowerPoint. I know what I'm going to say. And then yesterday, I make a trip to Lowe's because that's what you do on Saturday. So I'm going into Lowe's, and I'm thinking about my sermon and, you know, how God sees me. And as I'm driving up to Lowe's, of course, there's panhandlers in the median. And I'm driving up to Lowe's, and I'm trying to keep my, my eyes are locked on the road. I'm not looking left or right. I'm not making eye contact. And I drive right up to this woman who's standing there with a sign saying, you know, homeless, need help, anything will, do, anything will help. Um, but I don't make eye contact with her. And it's not until I'm driving into the parking lot of Lowe's, and I realize, oh, that's, that's what it means. That's what it means to not be seen. It's not about not being the center of attention at the family reunion. <laughs> as bad as all my suffering and pain was, oh no, I got you know, hot meals every day. No, it's the woman standing in the median with a sign saying, need help, anything will help, that I saw, but I didn't really see her. I didn't bother to make eye contact with her. I was like Simon the Pharisee. Yes, I knew she was present, but I didn't take the time to see beyond the things that I didn't like, the things on the outside. And no, even to this day, I don't know what to do, what is best with the panhandlers. How do you, do you, do you give them a few bucks? Do you give them some, some, I mean, I've got some gift cards for restaurants in the car. I would love it if I would have the, the energy or interest or or just the drive to give them a gift card and say, you know, here, um, God bless you, whatever. I don't know what's right in those situations, but what I do know is what's wrong. I didn't see that person. So let's keep moving. So we come back to today's text, and I will try to cover this quickly. We come to verse 8, and it says, The child grew quickly, or crowd grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. So what we have actually done here is we have skipped over about 13 or as much as 16 years. The child that is weaned here is Isaac. Ishmael is at least 13 years older than Isaac. A couple years have gone past. He is now being weaned. I have no idea at what age Hebrew children are weaned in this day and age or in that day and age. So we can assume he's probably one to two years old. Ishmael is 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, based on what we read in previous verses. Verse 9, 
But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking. That's not a good sentence, is it? <laughs> Sometimes the Hebrew people don't write in good English, I know, don't write English well. Um, some verses will say that the son was joking. Some will say that he was laughing. Um, there is this concept, some people will interpret this, that he was playing and that can be used in a sexual kind of way, that the older child, Ishmael, was was molesting the younger child. Um, all these different reasons are given for why Sarah wanted to send them out into the wilderness. But the thing that I think is important here is if you look at it in the Hebrew, the word that's translated here as mocking, and you notice it doesn't have a, a what is it, direct object here. It doesn't say who he's mocking. The word that's translated as mocking is the same word that is translated as Sarah's firstborn child. What's Sarah's firstborn child's name? Isaac, and Isaac literally means laughter. So what it says is that Ishmael was Isaac-ing. The way I interpret that is that Ishmael was acting as if he was the firstborn child, because literally he is the firstborn child. And we know that in those days that the firstborn child received a double portion of the inheritance. And the very next passage, the very next verse says this, this is Sarah speaking. Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. Again, there's no naming of these people. Um, Hagar and Ishmael are not given a name. They aren't given this identity. They're not given agency. But she seems to be more worried about her own money than about these people. So Abraham does send them out into the wilderness. God speaks to Abraham, promises Abraham, don't worry, your son, your firstborn son, Ishmael, will be a great nation. He does grow, and they are, there are people called the Ishmaelites in the Bible, and even the Muslims to this day will trace their lineage back to Abraham through the Ishmaelites. And God makes this promise to Abraham, but yet here is Hagar out in the wilderness without food, without water. And her son is sitting, sleeping underneath a bush. She has to distance herself from that son because she doesn't want to watch him die. And this is what God says to the angel in verse 17. He says, do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. And you can see the word play here. God has heard the boy. What does Ishmael mean? It means God hears even when the worst thing possible is happening to these people, when they're sent out into the wilderness, God still hears. And then, oh, I thought I had more there. Um, and then God shows to Hagar this water source nearby. God shows her because God sees her and helps her to see as well. So what can we get out of this text for this morning? This weird text that I went a strange way with, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, the first thing that I notice is the family of God includes a lot of people of questionable character. And you may be thinking in your family of some of the people in your background. And we just spent time with, with my family, we spent time with Sonia's family, and we are definitely blessed to have good, immediate families. But I don't think we're the only ones that if you go back a few generations, you start to branch out a little bit, there's some serious issues in our family. Like everybody else's, we have issues with alcoholism, abuse, drug abuse, sexual abuse, whatever kind of abuse you can imagine. I'm sure we all have those stories in our family. The good news is that God can still use these people anyway. And I note that Abraham isn't known for his unquestionable character. Abraham made some huge mistakes, and I am by no means trying to like, give him a pass on that. We need to continue to try to do better, to learn from our mistakes, but he is known for his unwavering faith. Stay strong in your faith, even though there may be questionable characters in your background or even in your own life. But the thing that I want to make sure we all know as we go from this place, the thing that we can take home from this message today is that God hears you, that God sees you. I know for some people that can be a little bit scary, like God's watching. <laughs> I saw that, and from up here, I can see it all. John Willis, I see you back there. You know, and I'm not God. You know, that, that, it's not how I mean it. I mean it like God sees you, God knows you, God knows your name, 
God knows the hairs on your head. God knows the, the, the spirit in your heart. God knows you better than you know yourself. And God loves you anyway. And we would do a whole lot better if we would take the time to get to know one another as well. Let's pray. God, today we thank you for this chance. You have called us together to get to know not only you, but to know one another, to support one another, to lift each other up in prayer, to support one another, to show each other the way, to lift each other up when we fall down. So God, help us, Lord, for we will all fail. We will all make mistakes. Maybe we won't make mistakes to the extent that Abraham did, but we will all fail frequently and we will fall hard. Help us, Lord, to pick each other up, to help each other when we're down, to be there to see one another and to know one another as you have known us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this brings us to the portion of our service for the sharing of praises and prayer concerns. And I thought this would probably be the appropriate time to share how things went with our